Welcome to yet another cast interview with one of the legendary Waltons. Today I'm chatting to distinguished actress Michael Laird, who's joining me now. It's the magic of the internet. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very happy to. I've just been doing my due diligence and I'm so impressed at your history of awards. I mean, I'm flabbergasted. You were nominated for six Emmy Awards as lead actress in a drama. You won three times and you were nominated for four Golden Globes. Well, congratulations. That's quite a, a record. But uh, I want to know about your life before the Waltons. I want you to tell me what life was like growing up on the farm in Connecticut. Oh, it was it was perfect, really. I, I, uh, I stole some money from my dad. You know, he used to keep change in his pocket and I would go in when they were asleep and I would go in and steal a quarter or whatever and you could buy five candy bars for a quarter. So I, I was a little kleptomaniac, I guess. And um, so my father found out, I guess one of my teachers busted me. She said, your, your daughter seems to be buying an awful lot of candy. And um, so he said, you're too old to spank. I think I was 10. He said, you're too old to spank, so you're going to have to earn, you're going to have to pay me back by working, uh, you know, on the farm. It was a tiny farm. It was what they call, in Wisconsin, they call it a hobby farm. Uh, in <laughs> they call it a gentleman's farm. So um, so it was only 21 acres, and it was absolutely beautiful. And um, so anyway, my father made a chart, and I got sort of half a penny for every egg I collected, and for cleaning the rabbit hutches, I got a quarter, and uh, for milking the goats, I got a nickel um, and, until I had paid him back. And I, I thought he was very wise to do it that way because I really learned a sense of responsibility and and uh, and I and of just somehow being capable. The worst part of it was going up at night because there was a boogeyman behind every bush. And it was terrifying. And well, I got to the barn and I'd turn on the lights and I'd smell the animals and the hay, and it, suddenly everything would be okay. And, and then when you were 11 years old, you moved to Austria. Would yeah. that be correct? Yes, we did. I did not know this at the time, but my father was actually working for the CIA, the uh, Secret Service. And um, oh. I just didn't know. I thought he was I thought he was writing. He said, I'm a writer. I'm writing. Uh, and But I used to wonder why he kept it, this room where he worked. There was this the sound of a, you know, a... Okay. telegraph machine and um and it was always locked and and we'd have to knock and then he'd let us in but he'd always cover up he'd always turn the paper over whatever he was typing and we just thought it was because he thought we were nosy and it was none of our business but of course he was doing a lot of stuff that i don't even want to think about <laughs> <laughs> and it was during this time that you discovered the theater well, yeah, I was um, when I was about eleven, I uh, or twelve maybe. I I suddenly got, I cried all the time, and I my hands shook, and um, so my mother took me to the doctor, and the doctor said, "Well, this young lady, this is a tiny little village in Austria that it just was only five years out of the war, um, so." None of the kids there were as developed as I was, being a hearty American girl. These kids had, you know, been undernourished during the war. So um, um, she said, well, your daughter has interests that most of these local children don't have. She wants to be a dancer. She's, you know, she's interested in the arts and blah, blah, blah. And um, so we, I suggest that you send her to a ballet school. And so they, they sent me off to a boarding school in England. And it was one, a wonderful um, experience. I was terribly homesick. I was one of, I cried a lot. And the teacher, one of the teachers one day said, Michael, could you cry a bit more quietly, please? <laughs> <'Cause> I was, <laughs> and, uh, so I was just homesick, but the training was fabulous. And that's where I really began to understand that I really wasn't a very good dancer. But I loved drama. I won the drama cup, the school drama cup, the, you know, just within the school. And the teacher said, you know, I, I suggest you become a, an actress rather than a dancer. You're not a very good dancer. So, so that's what. 
And this this was uh, Tring. The school the school was Tring. Would that be correct? It's still there in Hertfordshire. Boy, you have done your homework, haven't you? Yes, it's in Hertfordshire. Yeah. It was an old Rothschild mansion. In fact, on the bell, you know, down in the basement where the the servants' bell poles were, it had King Charles II on it. So it was quite oh. an incredible place. I guess he used to spend summers out there in the in the what had been a mansion and was now a school. Sure. That in this country. We don't have, unfortunately, we're such a new, I always say our country's in its adolescence. We think we know everything and we're really just learning. Um, but it, 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 we just don't have that kind of, it doesn't go back to King Charles II. We're just a very new country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and oh, moving forward, Michael, to the Waltons, um, your introduction was obviously slightly different to the others because you came in a, a little bit later. What, what was the story behind that? You came in to replace Patricia. Did, was Patricia always going to be just in the pilot? Well, I, she and I became very good friends. I, we, I was sitting in, um, in New York in, uh, where was I? One of the Orsos or one of the kind of New York hangouts for actors and theater people. And uh, this woman, I knew who she was because I had seen her in the show and I had seen her movies and she's a brilliant actress. And she, But she came over and she said, you know, I just want to tell you, I think you're very good in the part. And I We became friends. Uh, and later I said, you know, I'm so glad you turned that part down because it really changed my life. And she said, oh, but darling, I didn't. They didn't offer it to me. And I said, why not? She said, because I had a stroke and they were afraid that I would be a liability or something like that, you know, a physical wow. uh, liability. And this gracious woman who would, would have loved to have done the series uh, went out of her way to come over and congratulate me. And we became very close friends. Wow, that's quite a story. And so, uh, yeah. Did you audition for the role? Can you tell? Can you remember your, your your audition process? I did audition, and I can't remember much about it. it was so long ago. All I remember is um, I auditioned. There was a you know they have these long tables, and it was nothing but men. But there was a woman named Ethel Wynant who had come to uh, the theater where I was working, the repertory company in San Francisco called American Conservatory Theater. And this woman was a casting for CBS. She was the head of casting for CBS. And she would come, she, she would come to the theater and see what she thought was talent. And so the story goes, she wrestled Fred Silverman, who was the pr president of CBS at the time. The story is she wrestled him to the ground over me. God bless her. And um, I did a I did an audition and then I did a screen test where all I did was say, you look real good, John Boy. That's all I, I carried clothes in or something that I had sewn for it. Olivia had sewn for him. And I said, you look real good, John Boy. So I didn't get the part over my audition. I got the part because this wonderful woman at the wine that went to bat for me. God bless her. It turned my life around. It, 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 there's an unwritten rule in show business that never work with children or animals. What was your experience like? You worked with the kids for so long. They grew up with you. I've spoken to a couple of them already. Mary says that you uh, were very naughty at the table sometimes, uh, playing with salad, I believe. Would that, <laughs> would that be correct? I was supposed to be fixing a salad or something, and they were shooting it over and over and over, and I just took the whole bowl of lettuce and just tossed it up in the air. And they forgave me. The prop people, you know, they have to clean it up because we're 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 not allowed to touch anything. We actors, um, but they were very kind and forgave me for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We and I cursed a lot. I I have a really bad. I have a what did you call? Me? You said I'm a stevedore's mouth. And um, so that was not really appropriate. And I tried not to in front of the children, but um, they'd heard it all anyway, so it didn't matter. No, they were, you know, they were like my second fam. I spent more time with them during the show than I did with my own kids. There's not a bad apple in the bunch. Not one. Not one. There's not, I wish I had some salacious things to tell you about terrible things the kids did. I just, 
I, I can't because they were just wonderful, very professional when they were working and very exuberant and funny when, when we were sort of between takes, you know, Eric, I would get so tired sometimes because I had my own family and I would get really frustrated and Eric would make me laugh. And I remember once I, I laughed, he made me laugh so hard. I ended up sobbing with my head on the kitchen table and everybody went for coffee break, you know, um, because I was, <laughs> I was tired and uh, I had two families really to run. So, yeah. <laughs> now we have uh, some fan messages that have come through as well. Um, one that is from Skip in Connecticut. And oh. he says, Hi, Ma Hi, Michael. Do you still accept fan mail? I would love to write you a letter. <coughs> I do. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coughing. I just took a sip of coffee and went down the wrong way. Um, yes, I do receive fan mail. I I get some at home. <coughs> I get some at home, and some get sent to my managers or or my um and my agent. And I love getting fan mail. It means a lot to me. I I read everything, even back in the day when it would come in in boxes. Um, I always read. I couldn't answer everyone personally, but I always read every single letter. I felt I owed that to people who took the trouble to write. We we have a question from Ned. In Ecuador, who would like to know, uh, what is your? Uh, can you pluck out a, a favorite memory of Ralph Waite? Well, maybe not a favorite, except that you know Ralph was very, very loving, and Ralph um, got me sober. We were, but we used to go out to lunch and have a couple of martinis, and then go back on the set feeling not. Not drunk, because you couldn't function if you were drunk, but we'd be feeling no pain, let's put it that way. And Ralph um, said, I, I've gotten I've gotten sober. And I said, oh, I'm so, so, I feel so supportive of you, Ralph. That is just wonderful. And he said, and I think you should too. And I was shocked. What do you mean, me? Uh, I don't have a drinking problem, but I was drinking too much and for all the wrong reasons. And uh, so he got me sober. I'll be grateful to him. It's been over 45 years now since I've had any alcohol. And um, congratulations. Well done. For that. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, what a story. Uh, thank you to uh, Ned in Ecuador for, for asking. I think it's Ned Farnsworth. I think I know Ned and his family. He's a, uh, if he's the same person I'm thinking of, he uh, he's a minister and he's in Ecuador. Uh, he's probably in Ecuador um doing his ministry and god bless him wow wow but we have another question here's a good one as well this is from kathy in massachusetts who wants to know have you ever made the famous apple sauce cake in real life <laughs> no no i i the idea of apple sauce cake just turns my stomach to tell you the truth but no, I never did. But I have baked. I have baked cakes and pies. And so when my kids were little and bread, but um, I don't now because it's just my husband, my darling husband and me. It was very interesting to find out when I was speaking to Mary that the food they served on the table was real. It was a real kitchen and they actually served real food. Oh, it was disgusting um, because, well, you know, they would serve things on our plate then it would all get spooned back, you know, for one take. And then it would all get spooned back into the serving bowls for the next take. And then when it would all get put back on our plates. And if you notice, I think in all the years that the show was on television, I never ate. I just pushed things around on my plate. And now I watch other actors doing the same thing, thinking, oh, yeah, you're just pushing that food around on your plate. Because you have to match everything. And if you're halfway with the you have to match when you took the bite and how you chewed and you have to remember all that. So I just was, I guess I was too lazy. So I just kind of fiddled around with food on my plate. And plus it was <laughs> mostly revolting. I mean, the, the prop people, God bless them. They, they do the best they can, but after, you know, 14th take, the food gets pretty gruesome. <laughs> I really <do. laughs> Now, uh, lots of people asking, uh, me to ask you what your personal favorite episode of the Waltons was. There are three, but my very favorite is the anniversary because I think it 
it it really allowed Ralph and me to show how much we loved each other, and we did. It was a very um, spiritual and, and pure love. We never slept together. We thought about it, but we never did because we knew it would be dangerous. You you can get emo to, so emotionally involved with someone um, that it, it it could then cause problems later on. You're shooting a, a series for five years, so we 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 adored each other. We loved each other dearly, and um, and we kept it clean. I was fascinated in my research over the years to find out that Ellen Corby worked as a script girl for Hal Roach, and she actually worked with Laurel and Hardy. Did she ever talk about those days? Not really, no. But she was a stickler for, um, I don't know, something just happened. She was a stickler for um, correct, you know, being honoring the script. I mean, she was always on it, and um, I loved Ellen. She wasn't; she was crusty, even as a person. You know, like the character she played, she could be crusty. But I was with her shortly before she died, and Earl and I, Earl Hamner, who is the creator of the show, he and I interred her ashes into the Hollywood um, Cemetery. Ah, uh, oh. it was very touching, and um, I loved Ellen. Um, she wasn't easy, um, but she was, I remember once she got upset because some script thing bothered her and she locked herself in her dressing room. And um, the only person she would let in was me. And she was freezing, the air conditioner was on, her lips were blue and she was shaking with probably anger and frustration and the air conditioning. And I got the prop person to, to get her some, I said, get some whiskey, something. To warm her up immediately in blankets, and we did, and and then we sent her home. She, they took her home, and um, a few days later she had her stroke. I don't know if it was connected or not, but um, always easy doing a, a show like that because it was long hours, and um, and the scripts would come down sometimes, and and we actors were a pain in the neck because we would say Olivia would never say that, or Grandma would never do that, and of course. When, when a good script writer writes a good script, sometimes characters act out of character. And um, we were we were a little obnoxious at times. You know. Well, actually quite a lot obnoxious at times. <laughs> Saying, ah, we, that's not good. And, and sometimes it was, we were right, and sometimes we were just obnoxious. How soon did you get to see Ellen after a stroke? Oh, well, I went to see her at home and uh, where she lived. And she uh, uh, she had a very good friend named Stella. I can't, I suddenly can't think of Stella's last name, but they were very close. And, and uh, Stella took care of her uh, right up until the end. And Stella's own husband got sick and then Stella was taking care of him and Ellen. And um, I eventually went and got Ellen and took her into the motion picture home. And um, they put her in a room. This is a woman who'd been in the business forever. And I, I shouldn't say this because I may end up in a motion picture home and they won't. It's actually a lovely place. But for some reason, they had her in a double room facing a wall and a bathroom door. And I said, this won't do. And I, I got very upset. And uh, I said, you have to put her. She's dying. And you need to put her bed near a window where she can look out and see a garden or see something green and beautiful. And, and they did. They moved her and uh, gave her a, a room where she was able to look out. And unfortunately, she eventually died in the hospital. Wow, such a shame. Yeah. But um, it was nice to see that you had such a close relationship. And uh, uh, almost, uh, you're just like Mother Walton. Uh, uh, now, the, the other question I wanted to ask you, and, and lots of people have been asking this, is, you know, when... After the Waltons, you know, we're, there's always that danger when you're in a long-running series that you can become typecast. Did you find, did you have any of those problems moving forward? What was your experience after the Waltons like? Well, in, for television or film, I was always cast as nuns or nurses or, well, I got a series called Nurse, which actually, it's too bad it didn't go because I think there were wonderful New York writers and um it took place in new york which is where i lived and 
there was a lot about it that was wonderful. Unfortunately, it was the first show that Robert Holmey had produced. So there were long, nine, one 19 hour day. That's a long, long day. And when you're putting in hours like that, a weekend doesn't give you enough time to really fully recover. So I was absolutely exhausted and was at the time I was happy when they canceled the show. But now I look back on it and I, I wish it had continued because it was really, um, the scripts were great. The writers were wonderful. And, um, and it was shooting in New York, a city that I really love. So, yeah. What? And I won an Emmy for it, my husband reminded me. Oh. <laughs> that was the fourth Emmy. Three were the Waltons and one was Nurse. So, yeah, that was exciting. I didn't expect that at all. And it was just ooh, thrilling. We we, uh, we all got a thrill recently when you popped up uh, in the Jeffrey Dahmer show, uh, which is a massive hit on Netflix at the moment. So we know that you're still working. What's what's next in the pipeline for you, Michael? God, I wish I knew. Um, something will happen. It always does. But at the moment, I'm I'm going to I'm being forced to start writing my memoir again. So I'm thinking I should write about what it was like to drive down to LA in my little VW bug and stay at a, at a motel for 12 bucks a night. And uh, I went and then, you know, how I auditioned for this show, I knew nothing about and didn't really want because I was loving, I was playing Cleopatra and um, private lives at, at ACT, the, the theater I was connected with and you know I didn't really want to play some farm woman in her 40s I was 32 um I, I didn't want the part but I needed the money I had three kids to support and um and in in the long run I was extremely grateful it was like God had his hand on my shoulder he really did it's hard to believe it's been 50 years you all look so wonderful and I'm not being patronizing I'm being genuine, you all look so. <laughs> well, I look so great, but you know what? Where, you know, you get old. I I still have blonde hair because thanks to the help of my hairdresser, because my husband just said this is my husband right here, John Doherty, and um, he said when we got together, he said only two things: no cats, no gray. Well, we have a cat. So I'm still honoring his no gray, but I'm going <laughs> to streak in some white streaks and gradually go to my real color, which is hopefully white. Well, it all looks very natural from here, Michael. Uh, listen, I can't thank you enough for giving us your time today. I really, really do appreciate it. We've, we've got all the fans tuning in this week to, to hear all the different stories from all the cast members. And, and it's just, it's, that happy vibe that we get from the Waltons, it's the same happy vibe coming from these interviews. And and I can't thank you enough for, for agreeing to take part. It's such an honor to speak to you. Well, you've made it very easy and, and I've enjoyed it. And it it, it it touches my heart that the show resonates with people on, on, on such a deep level. You know, when, when I went to Bangladesh, I never thought anyone in Bangladesh even had a TV set. I learned later that, of course, they do. But um, I went there years ago for Save the Children, and they all knew the show, and re everybody related to it, even people who were, you know, had very, very little, very little. Um, and they related to the Waltons. So the, the show is kind of universal, and that means the world to me. It's very humbling. Okay, thank you again for, for your time today, and uh, love to the family, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you, Michael. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.